Hi, this is Evan Panagopoulos, and this is a short presentation of the Dodin system. The reason I'm doing this here in Ryslip at the Vale uh, is because that this is a very important uh, local location that has to do with the Battle of Britain. Uh, in this very field, uh, the website Bombsite has recorded four bombs falling just across the field during the Battle of Britain. Uh, so this is a quite interesting and relevant location. The Dolding system was the world's first wide area ground control interception system guarding Britain's airspace from airborne incursions. It was named after Fighter Command's Commander-in-Chief, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding. Uh, the Dowding system was an integrated defense system like no other before it. It brought together not just elements of the fighter command, like fighter planes, uh, but also ground defenses, barrage balloons and flak towers, such as the one uh, right behind me. The system had a clearly defined chain of command, enabling control of uh, both the flow of intelligence on incoming raids and the communication of orders. The RAF organized the defense of Britain into four geographical areas called groups. These were groups 10, 11, 12 and 13. Each group was subdivided into sectors and the main airfield in each sector was called a sector station. Each sector station had its own operation rooms from where fighter planes were directed into battle. Radar was a new technology during the Battle of Britain. A chain of radar stations uh, about 40 miles apart uh, were set at the south and east coast of Britain it was called Chain Home. They gave early warning of German raids as they approached Britain. But there were a number of problems. To begin with, low-flying aircraft could not be detected by Chain Home. Therefore, they had to create a secondary band of radar stations called Chain Home Low that could detect low-flying aircraft flying less than 1,000 feet. Another problem was that as the planes flew inland beyond the radar stations, they were out of range and could not be detected anymore. This is where the Observer Corps came in. Uh, men and women of the Observer Corps would listen for the hum of incoming aircraft or see uh, through binoculars, uh, trying to detect incoming aircraft beyond the range of the chain. In order to understand the importance of the Dowding system for victory during the Battle of Britain, we have to understand how early warning and interception systems were before that, during the Great War. This is when we have bombers flying over the Channel bombing Britain for the first time, especially London. And this is when we have the uh, establishment of the Royal Observer Corps as an early warning system. Uh, members of the Royal Observer Corps would scour the skies with binoculars, uh, listen for the sounds uh, of uh, incoming bombers and then scramble, of course, headquarters who would uh, then direct fighters towards the general direction uh, of the enemy and try to locate them in the skies and intercept them before they uh, upload their ammunition. This, of course, was not ideal as bombers got faster and faster, uh, interception times got shorter and shorter. Eventually, we had the advent of uh, a range of sound mirrors along the south coast of Britain that is given another 15-20 minutes of early warning uh, that again was rendered uh, pretty useless as bombers, uh, bomber engines became bigger, bombers became faster throughout the war. Those fast-flying bomber squadrons pose a major threat to their defences of Britain. They have already a very well-defined plan of attack, they have picked their targets, they fly quickly from A to B, offload their ordnance and head back without delay. The input from the Royal Observer Corps and the sound mirrors is, is great, but it's simply not enough. And uh, at some point in the interwar, it is understood that the only way to counter this threat is to uh, keep fighters in the sky performing sweeps all the time, uh, try to be there on location uh, when this information comes from the Observer Corps or from the sound mirrors, then these fighters already in the air can be directed uh, towards the general direction of the bombers and try to locate them, uh, cutting back respond times a bit. So the fighter command experiments with that, but it is understood at some point in the early 30s that 
But in order to scramble, assemble enough fighters to cover the entire front with sweeps uh, and be there on time and on target to intercept those incoming bombers is becoming untenable. It's just too many aircraft needed to be in the air at the same time and fighters that they usually spend most of their time on ground refueling, repairing and less up in the air, uh, it is becoming apparent that it would be impossible. You would have to have uh, multiples of fighter aircraft compared to the enemy uh, bomber force in order to make this uh, strategy sustainable. In the mid to late 30s, we have the advent of radar, uh, an early warning system that actually works, uh, detecting incoming aircraft from uh, much further than ever before. Uh, this culminates in the uh, chain home and chain home low radar system, radio towers based about 30 to 40 miles apart along the coast of Britain. It does work, but it's not uh, quite efficient. It picks up everything in the sky. It picks up uh, friendly squadrons performing sweeps, picks up uh, enemy bomber squadrons, and you cannot really tell uh, which one is friend and which one is foe. Uh, the other inefficiency is that there is such a tremendous flow of information, all these radar blips flowing in and uh, kind of relate to headquarters, and headquarters have to uh, make some decisions based on this and the Royal Observer Corps. Uh, it all, it's all kind of pushed down to uh, group headquarters, and it's all very uh, confounding information uh, that is not very clear and very accurate. Uh, a perfect example of this is uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, where uh, the radar uh, station at Pearl Harbor is picking up uh, the incoming squadrons of bombers, uh, but they don't act upon it because they are aware that there are some friendly squadrons of bombers returning from a mission two at the time, and they dismiss that very crucial piece of information because they have no way uh, to identify friend from foe and they have no way to cross-reference uh, the validity of their observation. And the rest is, as we know, history. So Dodin took all of the assets in his disposal, as well as the problems that came with these, and reorganized everything in a much more coherent and efficient structure. He created a new task force tasked with identifying enemy from friendly contacts on the radar screen, and he reorganized all this increasing volume of information, filtered it through the Fighter Command's headquarters at Bentley Priory. The filtering process that begins at Bentley Priory cascades down the organizational structure along with the delegation of command. In the map room of group headquarters, the map is constantly updated with uh, tokens displaying the locations of friendly and enemy squadrons. This information is then relayed to sector headquarters that have their own plotting map, and from there they can direct squadrons to scramble and intercept incoming aircraft. The filtering of information and delegation of command means that sectors and squadrons can receive just the information they need and act upon it quicker. Scrambling the fighters now is more efficient, interception vectors more accurate, and success rates soar. At the same time, fighter squadrons report back to the sector and group headquarters about their status, about their location, and this information flows back to Bentley Priory that retains the overview of the battlefield. Plotting maps are updated as well as status indicators. Information keeps coming in, rinse and repeat. It's a recipe for success.